Hey there, marketing researchers. In this video, we're going to go over key categories of primary data and their uses in marketing research. So <clears throat> we introduce ourselves to the idea of primary data collection. Of course, what we're talking about here is the type of data marketers typically collect when they are answering their own research question with their own research efforts. Given that many marketers typically try to answer similar types of questions with their research projects, it goes to follow that we have similar types of categories of data. So I'll introduce you to some of those categories and provide illustrative examples. I do want to mention that today's conversation uh, is focusing on primary data collection when we're focusing on collecting data about consumers. Of course, marketers don't only collect data about consumers. Sometimes we collect primary data about other brands that we might be competing with, data about companies, other organizations, if we're B2B or industrial marketers. We may actually collect information at the country level, product, uh, individual product categories, or aggregate industries. What we see here is what I call the wheel of variables. I don't think anyone else in the world calls it that, so you may not want to bring that up in casual conversations with your marketing friends. But what you'll notice here in the center here is behavior. All of these other variables, like demographic and socioeconomic at the top, and knowledge at the five o'clock uh, direction of the wheel, these are all measures that we often capture about consumers. However, all of them are ultimately trying to serve the grand purpose of understanding, predicting, and controlling human behavior. So that's why we have this wide ring of variables surrounding the central type of a primary data that we often collect, which is actual consumer behavior. I want us to never lose sight that when we're collecting all this other information, it's always in service to ultimately trying to understand consumer behavior. Okay, let's first introduce ourselves to demographic and socioeconomic variables. Demographic and socioeconomic variables are the type of variables that are commonly used to characterize the composition of human populations. I'm sure that you are familiar with the word of demographics and you're probably familiar with the word of socioeconomics. Um, in this case, we're talking about the variables that often inform socioeconomic study. What's very interesting about this is that there is actually no universal definition of what constitutes a demographic variable versus not a demographic variable, except for common practice. In fact, if you go Google right now and look for information about what defines a demographic variable, you'll notice that in most cases, the definitions aren't really a definition. Instead, they're just providing a list of examples of those types of variables that we study. With that said, there are a few general traits of a demographic variable. First, demographic variables tend to be objectively verifiable traits of individuals rather than the internal mental states like satisfaction, loyalty that we may collect in other categories of marketing uh, data. So common examples of demographic variables include age, income, family size, occupation, education, and so on. We're familiar with these types of variables because they are commonly collected by government agencies, uh, not, just, not just business organizations. Now a subset of demographic variables are socioeconomic variables. So these are the variables that are often used in relation to determining someone's particular socioeconomic status. Now this becomes tricky is that socioeconomic status actually has a variety of different competing definitions. So despite socioeconomic status being such a commonly used term and in casual language we have an understanding of it and in research people have understanding of it as well, there's actually more than one way to actually measure socioeconomic status. And I don't mean to dive you into all of the excruciating details of the different ways we measure these things other than to point out a few different ways. For example, there's something called the, Do the Duncan Socioeconomic Index or what this really is, is someone's occupational prestige. So that is, it's not just about how much money you make in the world based on your job. It's all about the sort of social status that you're obtained by virtue of your position in life and it's based on your occupation. However, despite all this argument in academia about the different ways we could choose to measure socioeconomic status, some of the biggest leading experts in this area have pointed out that, well, in reality, measuring just someone's household or individual income and or uh, assessing their level of education, these two explicit measures, which we all understand, uh, actually serve as excellent proxies of what someone's actual socioeconomic standing might be, uh, especially you uh, as applied marketing researchers. If you're interested in socioeconomic status as something to identify a market segment, just measuring someone's income or education level does serve as a decent proxy of that. So let's provide some illustrative examples here of typical demographic and socioeconomic variables. Here we have a measurement measuring someone's age, highest level of education that they've completed, and here's their combined annual household income. So all three of these would comprise types of demographic measures where 
the education level and the household income measurement level would be indicators that we could use to determine socioeconomic status. I just said earlier that one of the things that characterizes most demographic variables is that they tend to be objective traits about individuals. But in reality, measuring demographics can be much more complex than that. Think about the standard race and or ethnicity measure that you commonly see at the end of marketing research surveys and you often see in government surveys. In reality, race and ethnicity is not an objective trait of an individual. It's not something that can be definitively assigned to you. In the census, the U.S. Census itself recognizes that. Per their own words, an individual's response to the race question, which they use, they use race and ethnicity a bit interchangeably in their variety of their measures, is based upon self-identification. The Census Bureau does not tell individuals which boxes to mark or what heritage to write in. So in other words, with no consequence to any individual, any person can identify with any particular racial designation they, they wish to. An interesting thing to explain even more of these complexities when it comes along to measuring race and ethnicity, uh, this is another quote from John H. Thompson of the, the, uh, the Census. In 2014, he pointed out that, you know, in our diverse society, a growing number of people find the current race and ethnic categories confusing, these being the racial categories that they were using in the census uh, at the, in the 2010 version, or they wish to see their own specific group reflected in the census. The census individuals are sensitive to changing cultural norms uh, and social norms, and we can see that in some of the experiments they actually ran with the census data collection instrument uh, here. So what you're looking at in this slide here is the standard uh, census version from 2010 where questions related to race and ethnicity were asked. And there's a few notable traits here I'm going to point out to you by way of looking at one of the alternative versions that they experimented with. Literally, they did an A-B experiment. They had the control version, and then they, with a random subset of the U.S. population, they actually used this experimental version to test for differences in responses. And this is just one of the experimental versions, but let's take a look at some of the differences here. First, they make explicit that you can check more than one box, that if you're of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin. They, uh, they directly offer some new examples. So in the previous example, it was Argentinian, Colombian, Dominican, Nicaraguan, and uh, Salvadoran, and Spaniard. And here we have Dominican, Salvadoran, Colombian, and Spaniard. For identifying someone's race, for white, it's no longer without any examples. It now includes German, Irish, Lebanese, Egyptian, and so on. And a big change, and this came after uh, uh, some lengthy complaints uh, in, in 2010, uh, for black or African-American, they dropped a very contentious word in the 2010 census, and that was black, African-American, or Negro. And now in 2016, it's likely for many of us, it strikes us as inappropriate that this word would be included on the census form. There's actually an interesting conversation about this that people from the census report. And what they found was, uh, in many cases, there's a subset, it tends to be an older African-American audience, that they would actually write in this word uh, as a way to describe themselves. And by virtue of them writing it in, they thought that this was appropriate to keep in the 2010 version of the census uh, because it was a way that some individuals in the United States did choose to identify themselves. But of course, by keeping all three of these designations on a single line, for those individuals who identify as black or African American and find this term uh, insulting, derogatory, and appropriate, this is obviously causing uh, distress for them. So this was a bit. This was a big change for the census going forward, and it won't be in the 2020 version of the census that's coming out. It becomes immediately clear that these so-called demographic markers that are objectively verifiable are not necessarily uh, able to be able to do so as easily as they make it seem. We as marketing researchers still frequently use demographic uh, and socioeconomic variables, despite some of the difficulty associated with properly measuring them. One of the main reasons that we collect demographic and socioeconomic variables when we're collecting primary data is because it does often afford us the ability to compare our results to results from other secondary data sources. Because demographic and socioeconomic, socioeconomic variables are collected almost in such a standard form in so many other forms of research, we can then use our own results and map them onto those other results, hopefully creating a bigger, richer tapestry to answer questions related to our marketing research problem. Another use of demographic and socioeconomic variables are that they often are used to set very initial boundaries of market segments. So these are very broad, coarse segments. For example, you may think about the Nielsen PRISM system that they used to segment U.S. households. Although there were over 60 precise detailed market segments, 
the initial way that they sliced apart those segments were based on three demographic and socioeconomic variables, and that was where people lived, the stage in the life they were at, and the degree of wealth that they possessed. From there, once those initial, those initial variables were used to create initial market segments, then other variables were used to then drill down deeper. Personality refers to individual differences in characteristic patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving. This word characteristic is very important when understanding what personality means. That's to say that although individuals may vary from day to day depending on context, mood, or particular situations, when we refer to someone's personality, we're referring to someone's general overarching way of being. Similarly, for lifestyle, we're referring to a particular way that someone lives the way a person or group of people tend to live their lives. These are related concepts in marketing. Sometimes they even use these phrases interchangeably. However, in the world of marketing and in marketing research, when we refer to personality, we tend to be focusing on the individual's state of mind, even though behaviors per their actual academic de definition can actually be part of someone's personality. While lifestyle, when we use this term in marketing, tends to emphasize actual marketplace behaviors, the things that people actually do out there in the world. With that said, when marketers use the word lifestyle, we are often talking about both marketplace behaviors as well as the way they are thinking and feeling. Now there are literally hundreds upon hundreds of different personality traits that have been identified by psychologists, many of which have been proven to be useful for marketers for market segmentation, targeting, brand positioning purposes. However, if you took an introductory psychology course, you may remember there are the big five personality traits. And you'll remember that because the acronym OCEAN will come into your head. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Sometimes this phrase has been rebranded as emotional stability. These five personality traits are called the big five because they have shown to be very persistent and identified through a variety of different research studies. Some people even argue that all of the other personality traits are some mixture and derivative or second order, second order effect of these big five traits. But that's a debate for the academics, not one necessarily for the everyday applied marketing researcher. There's more than one way to measure how someone fares with respect to these five different personality traits. What I'm showing you here is a very short form 10 item scale that based on someone's response would tell you how they score and with respect to each one of these five personality traits. For your convenience, you can see how each one of these survey questions maps on to the five different personality traits. So if someone was actually taking this survey, they'll be asked the following question, how well do the following statements describe your personality? I see myself as someone who is reserved. And then, as with all the other remaining statements, a Likert scale format is being presented where the person scores themselves from a one to five on each one of these questions. You may also notice that some of these questions are reverse coded. For example, look at the extroversion uh, question item one. So I see myself as someone who is reserved. Well, if someone is strongly extroverted, you would expect them to disagree strongly with this statement. On the other hand, I see myself as someone who is outgoing and sociable, the other extroversion measure, we would expect that individual to score a five here. And that's what it is to mean to be reverse coded. That is, we would to actually score this individual once we would flip these numbers and then score them together. Here's a simple visualization just illustrating how two different types of people may score on this 10 question personality inventory scale. We see that person A, represented by the blue lines here, scores very high in agreeableness and openness, but relatively low on neuroticism and conscientiousness, compared to person B, who scores very high in neuroticism and very high on conscientiousness. Now, marketing researchers may often generate questionnaire items to categorize demographically similar consumers into distinct lifestyle categories. This is often a key purpose of, of, of measuring an individual's lifestyle when we collect this type of primary data. Let me give you an example of where we may 
as marketing researchers see value in generating a set of lifestyle-based uh, survey question items. According to the 2014 GFK University Reporter, 76.1% of male adults 18 to 34 have played a video game in the last 30 days. In other words, if you're a marketer of a particular type of video game looking to target this demographic group, it's not actually that helpful to know that male adults 18 to 34 play video games. In fact, over three quarters of them have played a video game in the last 30 days. Of course, that means not all of them are playing the same types of video games for the same reason or spending the same amount of money. So as a marketer of video games, you would want to know which sort of lifestyle category they fall into related to video game playing. Therefore, you might generate a series of questions about the types of games a particular male adult 18 to 34 played, the amount of money and the frequency with which they played those games, how they play those games. Are they social games? Do they play by themselves? For example, do they play mobile? Do they play on via computer? Do they play via console? Finally, we may also measure how what their motivations are for participating in games. If they are highly competitive, they may compete in tournaments, whereas if they are more social and interactive, they may be playing for friendship and camaraderie. For example, if you were working for Riot Games, the producer of the largest and most popular esports video gaming platform right now, League of Legends, you may realize you're trying to reach a very different young male video game playing audience than young adult males 18 to 34 who play the popular mobile game Candy Crush. So I think by way of example here we've illustrated some of the key uses of personality and lifestyle data. Marketing practitioners tend to treat personality and lifestyle characteristics for individuals as, as essentially fixed. Of course people's lifestyles and their personalities can evolve over time, but in the small snapshot of time that a marketer might be thinking about utilizing this information, we treat these as sort of inherent traits of the individual. So this type of information is very useful for high resolution market segmentation, and that was illustrated clearly through the video game example previously. By knowing in the traits of someone's personality and their lifestyle, this provides much more useful and deeper insights beyond mere demographics that allow marketers have a better understanding how they may want to shape the tone and the content of their marketing communications based on someone's personality, for example. How to position a brand to align with a target market. So, for example, individuals who are extremely outgoing, extremely extroverted, we may expect uh, a brand trying to reach that same audience to position itself to be also perceived as outgoing and extroverted. Marketers are often interested in measuring a consumer's awareness of a brand, product, concept, service, experience, and so on. This is because marketers often think about a consumer's path to purchase as beginning with awareness. You may be familiar with the concept of the purchasing funnel. However, not all awareness is equally valued by marketers. For example, there's top of mind awareness. Top of mind awareness is that type of awareness that can be activated by individuals without any sort of uh, external stimuli uh, helping them dig that awareness out of their memory. Uh, sometimes there's awareness, there's also awareness where a uh, contextual triggers help to evoke that awareness. Finally, perhaps the lesser form of awareness, it's where an individual can recognize uh, having seen something previously, but they actually actually be shown that same stimuli again to say, aha, I recognize that. Let's illustrate these three different forms of awareness by way of example. Consider this question. Name the first two brands that come to your mind. Do it. What are the first two brands that popped into your head? Were they Apple and Nike? If they were, according to the Student Monitor 2014, of the first two brands that a college student would say off the top of their mind, 40% of the time Apple would be one of the two brands and Nike would be one of the two brands 24% of the time. This is clearly an example of unaided recall. Now, take a moment to think about the last time you went shopping for groceries. See if you can imagine some of the different brand names you saw while you were actually at the grocery store. In the space below, list some of the brand names that you remember seeing. Now what's different about this measure compared to the previous measure? It's clearly these first two sentences. Here, we're trying to help the individual put themselves back into the previous context of which we're trying to ask them to recall some information. Finally, here we see an example of a recognition measure. Have you ever seen this brand of food at a grocery store? 
And here, we're not providing any aid. We are literally providing an individual the exact stimuli and we're merely asking them, have you seen this thing before? Unfortunately, in practice, sometimes these recognition measures, like this last one I just showed you, sometimes these are also called aided recall measures because there is an aid right here. However, I think it's useful to keep in mind that an aid is where you're helping someone along, like our second example, where our third example, a recognition measure, we are literally providing someone the exact stimuli and merely asking if they can see that, if they have seen that thing before. Marketing researchers often collect information about a consumer's knowledge as well. It's important to keep in mind that there's two types of knowledge that we're often interested in measuring, sometimes both or sometimes just one depending on the particular situation. First, there's subjective knowledge. This is someone's belief about their level of knowledge about a topic. So this isn't actually what they know, it's how much they think they know. Objective knowledge is someone's actual demonstrable knowledge about a topic. It's important to separate these two concepts because these two things are rarely in alignment. What I'm showing you here is a chart that illustrates something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. This Dunning-Kruger effect is well known in social psychology and behavioral uh, economics. You see here, are two different lines. The dark line is, the, is how someone rated themselves on their perceived ability on a given test. The grade line here is how well that individual actually performed on that test. For example, what this chart is showing you is that for individuals who actually did very, very poorly on the test, so in other words, their objective knowledge was very low, those individuals tended to perceive themselves as being about average. That's what percentile, performing about in the middle of the pack. So they guessed that they knew about this much, but in reality, they only knew this much. And then actually we see at the top end here, we also see a miscalibration of subjective and objective knowledge, but not quite as egregious. We see that those individuals who indeed actually knew a large amount only estimated themselves to perform slightly better than average. There's a lot of debate in the literature about what's driving the Dunning-Kruger effect or this mismatch between subjective and objective knowledge. For our purposes here, it's enough to say that there typically is a substantial difference between the two. So we as marketing researchers need to be very clear about which one we intend to measure because measuring one is unlikely to give us information about the other. Let's look at this example here related to craft beer. Look at these statements on the left hand side. We're asking a survey respondent to say how much they agree with the following statements. Now based on our previous conversation about knowledge, would this be a subjective knowledge measure or an objective knowledge measure with respect to craft beer? The answer would be subjective knowledge. We're asking the person to reflect on how much they believe they know. At no point here did we actually assess how much they actually know. If we wanted to measure objective knowledge about craft beer, we'd have a, multi we'd have a variety of different ways to do it. But one, re one way we might do it would be very similar to the same way that a professor tests you to demonstrate how much objective knowledge you have about a course topic. We'd give them a quiz. Here's a four question beer quiz. What are the traditional four main ingredients in beer? Do you know what the answer to this one is? Barley, yeast, water, and hops. If you got that correct, that would dem demonstrate some objective knowledge about beer. Why do marketers measure awareness and knowledge? Well, sometimes we track awareness longitudinally or over time to check, line, to check for baseline performance of our advertising campaigns. The only goal of advertising shouldn't simply to be to create awareness, but it is a baseline goal. So we would expect to see over time that a aggressive, large spend advertising campaign should increase overall awareness about our product or brand. We may measure objective knowledge a consumer may have about our product, our service, or our brand because it can identify gaps between what the benefits are that our product offers and what people may actually be looking for. We may measure a consumer's objective knowledge because it may identify gaps between the benefits that our product offers versus what people actually understand about our product. One example of this you may find in recent Sam Adams beer ads. Recent Sam Adams beer ads have featured uh, actually educating consumers about hops and the different types of hops and the types of beers that are in the taste of beers that are derived from the use of different hops. This would be an example of an advertising campaign that's actually trying to educate consumers and hopefully eventually then persuade them that Sam Adams provides that useful benefit. 
attitudes are simply someone's overall expression of liking or disliking towards a person, idea, object, or any other clearly defined target. When defining an attitude towards a particular object, we have to be clear about in what way are we having them characterize that particular object. For example, someone may have a positive overall attitude about San Diego State University. They may have an extremely positive attitude about the College of Business Administration, and they may have an exceptionally positive attitude towards their marketing research professor, yet they may have an extremely negative attitude towards the parking at San Diego State University. Therefore, we have to be clear at which level we are measuring an individual's attitude towards a particular object. Attitude measurement is extremely common in primary data collection of marketing research. We believe that someone's attitude towards a particular thing is a good leading predictor of whether they are interested in it or might be willing to purchase it. There's multiple different ways to do attitude measurement. Perhaps the most direct is simply to ask them what is their attitude towards a thing. So what you're looking at here is a picture of the USA Jammy Pack. Not only is this a cool fanny pack, it's patriotic and it has a speaker built into it so that you can plug your phone in and jam tunes while playing. So the question may be, overall, what is your attitude towards the jammy pack? Clearly, in this particular example, we might expect everyone to say very favorable. But let's imagine a crazy world where some people may have different opinions. So this is clearly a very direct and straightforward way to measure someone's attitude towards the jammy pack. However, more advanced ways can often be a little more insightful to marketing researchers. So let's look at that example. Now in this version, we won't be measuring someone's overall attitude to the jammy pack directly. Instead, we first define four of the most important traits about a particular product category, in this case, clothing accessories, we define as the relevant category. And we measure how important those different traits are to someone's purchase decision. So let's look at these four examples here. Uh, apparently we've done some other previous research to identify that these are the four most relevant traits. Uh, we say the, the accessory should be made well, the accessory has a practical functional purpose, the closing accessory makes me stand out from the crowd, and the closing accessory fits in with my current sense of style. And on a five point scale we asked how important these traits were to a particular individual. We see here that this person, when it comes to clothing accessories, doesn't actually find a practical functional purpose to be important to them personally, although apparently in the general population it was, whereas having the clothing accessory fit in with their current sense of style is extremely important. Now that we've established how important this is to a particular individual, we then follow up with finding out how much they agree that they have a positive attitude towards those related traits of the, of the actual jammy pack. So in this case, we see that this person on a one to five scale tends to agree the jammy pack appears to be well constructed, it appears to be extremely functional, and the person would stand out from others. However, this person does not think that the jammy pack would fit in with their personal sense of style. Now we simply do a weighted summation of these two scores to find this person's overall approximated attitude towards the jammy pack. So 4 times 4, 1 times 5, 3 times 5, 5 times 1 equals a score of 51. Now if this is a good or bad attitude is something that we can't know in the absolute, we can only know it relatively. So it would make more sense if we compared this to some other attitude evaluation of a, a comparative product. Let's take a look at this fanny pack and imagine that this person also evaluated this fanny pack. Now when it comes to fanny packs, <clears throat> I'm sorry, when it comes to clothing accessories, we already know how important these traits are regardless of the particular target. So we know this person still scores a four, one, three, and five, regardless of uh, whether it's this fanny pack or the jammy pack. But their actual evaluation of this particular fanny pack is likely to be different from that of the jammy pack. So in this particular case, this individual strongly agreed with almost everything except for making them stand out of the crowd. The jammy pack outperformed on standing out of the crowd. And this more subtle fanny pack only received a neutral score of three out of five. However, when we do the weighted summation again, we find that this particular person would be approximated to have a much higher attitude towards this fanny pack rather than the jammy pack. And that's no surprise because we have evidence of early photographs of The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, 
wearing a similar fanny pack and looking extremely stylish. So far we've introduced you to the idea of measuring attitudes by way of two different examples. However, we need to also differentiate between explicit and implicit attitudes. Explicit attitudes are the ones that are most commonly measured in marketing research. They're explicit because it is one that someone can deliberately think about and report on. In other words, if they can fill out a survey question telling you their attitude, whether directly or indirectly, towards that object, it's explicit. On the other hand, marketers have an awareness that implicit attitudes play an important role in consumer decision making. We just don't tend to measure them as often because it's tricky. Here's another example of an explicit attitude measurement, simply asking people their attitude towards six different bands. But implicit attitudes are different. From the Project Implicit website at Harvard, implicit attitudes are the positive and negative evaluations that occur outside of our conscious awareness and control. And they provide a nice example. Even if you say that you like math, which is your explicit attitude, you say you're favorable towards it, it's entirely possible that you might associate math with negativity and not even know it. In this case, you would say that your implicit attitude towards math is negative. This example is important because it's suggesting that sometimes our explicit attitudes may not line up with what our implicit attitudes are. And importantly, this bold section here probably makes it clear why marketing researchers often don't measure implicit attitudes in their primary data collection. Because if implicit attitudes exist outside of conscious awareness and control, we have to have some sort of clever measurement system to actually find out what those implicit attitudes are. The implicit association test is the most common approach to rigorously measure someone's implicit associations. I have a video that I can show you showing someone take an implicit attitude association test. We'll so show that in a moment.
You can also check out the Project Implicit website. If you go to the Project Implicit website, you can take a number of implicit association tests yourself for free and find out how you perform. Now the Project Implicit website doesn't provide any tests for implicit association that are immediately and readily uh, available, uh, relevant to, mark, to most marketing researchers. Most of their questions tend to relate more closely to those things related to public policy or social issues. With that said, there's a number of situations where you can imagine implicit associations are also relevant to products, brands, and variety of consumption experiences. This is especially true when there may be some sort of socially acceptable attitude someone may have towards something, but implicitly they may have a different attitude. Marketers make extensive use of attitude data. We measure people's attitudes towards ads, brands, products, services, experiences, and so on. A lot of these measurements of attitudes form an essential basis for many of the marketing models that we use to determine people's brand preferences across a variety of competing brands, anticipated market share amongst competitors, and forecasting sales into the future. A fundamental belief here is that if we know someone's attitude towards a particular brand or product relative to other offerings, that, that attitude will tend to link towards their intentions towards that product and those intentions will link towards purchase. Detailed attitude evaluations where we find provide specific detailed evaluations can also be used for product development and marketing communication campaigns. Beliefs are simply the degree to which a consumer believes something to be true. In other words, a consumer's belief could in fact be objectively true, or it could be false, or it could be undeterminable. We may never know whether it's true or false. A consumer's beliefs could also be based on extensive, thoughtful justification or based on very little critical thought at all. All that's important about a belief is that the person believes that thing to be true. This is where I'm reminded from Rufus from Dogma where he reminded us that I think it's better to have ideas. You can change an idea, but changing a belief is a lot trickier. Marketers also take heed of Rufus' advice. Knowing that changing a belief can be very tricky, many times in marketing, we measure people's beliefs not to change them at all, but instead to recognize them as solid rocks that we have to work our marketing around rather than try to alter. Here's a series of examples of belief-based research questions that was collected by the Pew Research Center related to the internet, science, and tech. Is it generally safe or unsafe to eat genetically modified food? Is the earth warming due to human activity? Are childhood vaccines generally safe or unsafe? Now what's interesting about these first three questions is that with enough science and enough research, we can likely determine whether these statements are objectively true or false. With that said, finally, let's take a look at this last question. Do you believe that the US is the greatest country in the world? Well, this is an indeterminable question. We'd have to understand what the word greatest means, and clearly the word greatest doesn't mean the exact same thing to every single person. So it's not objectively true, nor objectively false. It's one of those types of things that can never be completely determined. It's always in the eyes of the beholder. If you'd like to see more examples of these belief measurement questions, go check out the 2016 general public survey that the Pew Research Center conducted. Now, how do marketers use belief data that was collected via primary research? Generally speaking, marketers tend to treat consumers' beliefs as unmovable. They are factors that the marketer must work with or work around rather than change. For example, let's take a look at this chart here that comes from the USDA. What we're seeing here is that organic food sales are substantially increasing year over year in the United States. This likely corresponds to people's changing, changing beliefs regardless to the healthiness and importance of eating organic foods. Of course, that isn't to say that marketers never try to change beliefs. The Ad Council, for example, runs numerous campaigns that tend to focus on changing people's beliefs and enacting positive social change. The example we see here comes in part out of the CDC, where they're recommending that young children receive a vaccination against HPV. Notice that statement up above, HPV vaccine is cancer prevention. This is an important attempt to change people's beliefs about what the role of the HPV vaccine is, because the public dialogue has included some thoughts that the HPV vaccine is actually about allowing for sexual promiscuity. In this case, this campaign's focusing on changing people's belief to thinking of it as a healthy medical treatment that'll take care of young adults into their later life. When we talk about measuring motivations in marketing, 
we are we have to be clear about which of two different ways we may be talking about motivations. First, sometimes when we talk about motivations, we're talking strictly about consumers' explanations for what drives their marketplace activities. In other words, we're emphasizing the role of manifest motivations. Let me provide an example. Let's say someone purchases a new MacBook. What reasons might they give to explain this marketplace activity? Well, they may say the MacBook is easy to use and Apple has reliable laptops. These are manifest motivations. This person is directly conveying what their motivations are to make this marketplace action. Now, when we look at psychological definitions of motivation, we realize there's more to it than mere manifest motivations. From a psychological standpoint, we're talking about the internal state or conditions that activate consumer behavior towards a specific direction. The wants and needs that stimulate the underlying engagement in some sort of goal-oriented behavior. What's important about these two statements here is they don't say that the person has to be explicitly aware of what that motivating state might be, merely that it exists internally within them. Which leads us to our final bullet point. Emphasi this definition tends to emphasize the role of latent motivations, those things that lurk beneath us that we aren't immediately attuned to when we're prompted without detailed elaboration. But there's still room for manifest motivations even within this definition, certainly. Let's consider some deeper perhaps latent motivations that someone may have for purchasing a new MacBook. Maybe they really want to fit in with all the other students. Or maybe other students will think that the person looks creative and innovative if they have a new MacBook. These type of motivations are the types of deeper seated motivations that trigger us to do things in the real world, but either we are unable or unwilling to recognize those underlying motivational states immediately. This, of course, creates some interesting challenges when we think about measuring motivations in primary research. The question then becomes, on a, based on our particular research task, are we, are we confident with merely measuring surface level motives or manifest motivations? Those are easy to measure. Those are the things that people are able to tap into directly. Or are we looking to measure underlying motives, those things that lurk even deeper beneath? If we're okay with measuring manifest emotion, motivations, things are much easier for us as marketing researchers. Take example of this state of content study that came out of Adobe. This study was goal was rather simple. It was trying to ask people what were the motor motivations for sharing content in the online space. If you look at these, if you look at these statements, these statements all correspond to something that we likely can see can see as manifest motivations. Make people laugh, give awareness of a particular issue, show friends content they think they'll like. These are the type of things that we might tap into the top of uh, top of mind to explain why we shared a particular piece of content. On the other hand, if we were to tackle this as the same type of study, but we wanted to tap into more deeper-seated motivations for why people were sharing content, one set of those things might come from academic research who some academic researchers are arguing we should think about the type of deep-seated evolutionary triggers that have motivated us as we've evolved over, over uh, multiple generations to the current state that we're at. In this particular study from the Journal, Journal of Consumer Psychology, they identified seven fundamental evolutionary motives that might explain everyday marketplace behavior, self-protection, disease, avo disease avoidance, affiliation, seeking and acquiring social status, seeking and acquiring mates, retaining those mates, and taking care of children. If it was true that a desire for self-protection actually was a motive for ser sharing certain types of social content, we might quickly realize that we're gonna need some sort of advanced research techniques to Behavioral intentions are simply the anticipated or planned future behavior that an individual has. Here's two examples. In the next year, what would you say are your chances that you'll buy or lease a new automobile? Or another option, do you plan on buying a PlayStation 4 in the next 30 days? Yes, maybe, no, or you don't know. What's true about both of these? These are measuring someone's intentions. It's entirely possible that if your car suddenly breaks down, you might have to buy or lease a new automobile in the next year, even though you don't plan on it. In both of these cases, we're asking people to look towards the future within a certain time frame and make an approximation of the actual behavior that they'll do. We commonly measure behavioral intentions in marketing research. Surprisingly, research about the connection between intentions and actual consumer behavior shows that, generally speaking, large to moderate changes in people's intentions tends to only lead to small to moderate changes in their actual behavior. In the context of marketing, we have found that purchase intention questions tend to perform poorly as predictors of actual marketplace behavior. 
In other words, what people say they will do doesn't do a particularly good job of predicting what they actually will do. With that said, there is still a weak to moderate positive correlation between intention and actual behavior. A research study way back in 1989 did a wonderful job of demonstrating just how weak this connection between intention and behavior really is. This study from Jameson and Bass grabbed several hundred studies in marketing research where two things were done. First, people's purchase intentions were measured and whether or not they actually did purchase the same product was also measured. Therefore, these authors had a great understanding of how often someone's intentions mapped up to their actual purchase behaviors. Let's take a look at the dark line here, at the top part of the chart. What we see on the x-axis is the stated purchase intentions that individuals had for these, for these types of products. So if the person said they definitely will not buy, we would imagine that corresponds to 0% purchase probability. However, when the authors analyzed the data, they found that people who said they definitely will not buy non-durable products on average, they actually purchased those products about 12 to 13% of the time. In other words, there was a mismatch between intentions and actual behavior. In addition, let's look at the top of the line here. When people said they definitely will buy a product, which we would imagine corresponds to 100% purchase intentions, in reality, people had actually only bought the product 42 to 43% of the time. Despite the generally weak correspondence between stated intentions and actual behavior, Intention data still remains extremely popular in marketing research. Why is this? Well, marketing researchers are practical people. We collect data today to hopefully provide us insights that make us better in the future. The nice thing about intention data is it is forward-looking. Although it's imperfect in many ways, it is at least a direct attempt to try to measure and look into the future. Therefore, intention data still remain, remains quite popu popular to help inform sales forecasts, predicting future market share, estimating the performance of new products that have yet to enter the market. Satisfaction is the degree to which a product, service, or consumption experience performs relative to the consumer's expectations. Satisfaction is likely the most commonly measured construct in all of marketing research. When you look at the definitions of satisfaction, it's clear that there's two things that we need to be measuring to know a customer's actual satisfaction level. First, we need to know what their expectations were going in. Then, once they've completed that consumption experience, we need to measure their evaluative performance. However, when you look at actual satisfaction measures in the world of marketing research, it's clear that we tend to presume that consumers themselves understand what the definition of satisfaction is because we often don't measure what their expectations were heading into the experience. For example, let's take a look at the satisfaction measure at the top. How would you describe your level of satisfaction with our complaint resolution process? Very dissatisfied to very satisfied. What's clear here though is that at no point do we actually know what the person's expectations were heading into the complaint resolution process. So we're putting it on their back that they have to understand that satisfaction is supposed to mean their actual, the actual performance relative to what the expectations were. Let's look at the example below where there's an attempt to measure someone's initial expectations and their value to performance relative to those expectations. Before you visit our brewery, how would you describe your expectations for the quality of our beer? Did the person have low expectations or extremely high expectations? After having our beer, how well did it meet your expectations? Below, met, or exceeded? Here we can see that if someone merely responded that, that we met expectations, we wouldn't necessarily have to be upset if going in they had extremely high expectations. We measure satisfaction so frequently because we make extensive use of it in marketing. Satisfaction is known to be a predictor of customer retention, market share, sales, and profitability since it's a leading indicator of things that we care about as key performance indicators with marketing success. It goes, to, it goes as no surprise that we're all still interested in measuring it systematically. In addition, satisfaction data is often collected systematically in customer relationship management systems to proactively manage the efforts of service personnel. As an example, perhaps you have bought a product on Amazon recently and a few days later after you received the product, you received an automatic invitation to provide satisfaction feedback regarding your purchase from the vendor who sold you the product. In those cases, that's an automated response coming from their CRM system where they're trying to make, be sure to proactively manage uh, your experience with them so that if there's any problems, you would be able to be you would be able to receive resolution or if you were happy perhaps they can coax you into relieving them a positive review
Finally, we have the type of primary data that all of the other types of primary data are trying to help us understand. Consumer behavior. Behavior is simply what individuals have done or are doing. It's a physical activity or action that takes place under specific circumstances at a particular time and involves one or more actors. Oftentimes, we don't directly observe someone's behavior. Instead, we ask respondents to recall those behaviors and report them to us. Unfortunately, accurate memory and reporting can often be challenging for respondents. For example, research has taught us that people tend to be both inaccurate and biased in recalling when a particular event occurred. People tend to be both inaccurate and biased in recalling the number of times a particular event occurred. When we say inaccurate, we mean they are wrong. They are not accurate and they are off by some way. When we say biased, we mean that there are systematic ways in which people are wrong, whether they tend to exaggerate up, exaggerate down, guess too early, or guess too late. However, people do tend to perform better at recalling if a specific event occurred at least once, but not exactly how many times within a defined range of time. Let's look at examples of measuring behavior via recall. Look at the top one. In the last month, how many days did you purchase an alcoholic drink at a restaurant or bar? Right now, imagine you had to answer that question as a consumer taking a survey. How would you approach answering this question? Would you be able to recall every single day in the past month, count up exactly the number of days that you were at a restaurant or bar and order an alcoholic drink? If you're not a drinker, this is probably pretty easy. If you are someone who does a drink at times, this might be very challenging. Look at this next example. Generally speaking, how many times do you work out in a week? Zero, less than once, once per week, two or three, four or five, six or more times. Notice that this type of behavior recall isn't looking for precise accurate answers. Instead, it's looking for general patterns of behavior. Finally, in the past week, have you purposely purchased organic meat, fruits, or vegetables from a grocery store? Yes, no, I don't remember. This last example to make the recollection effort relatively easy. We're only looking back a week. We're asking people not how many times or what they bought. We're simply asking them to recall the behavior. Most people we would expect would be a little better at this task than some of the more complex recollection tasks. Unfortunately, from a marketing data quality standpoint, it's a little less useful to simply know if someone did or did not do something. We often want to know how often and how much money they've spent on doing those things as well. We often measure behaviors through direct observation as well. This is particularly true in the world of big data and in a world where so much of our activity is occurring online. Many consumer behaviors and many of those that actually precede purchase are now tracked automatically. Earlier I mentioned that there's often bias in people's ability to recall when something actually occurred. Let me illustrate one of those biases that has been demonstrated by a number of different studies. It's called the telescoping bias. So let's take a look at this timeline here. For our purposes, all we need to imagine is that here on the far right side, this is now. And on the far left side, this is the distant past. We don't need an exact number of uh, days or to illustrate the point. And on that, let's imagine right now a survey question is asked. When was the last time you bought fast food? The, per the question is asking the person to recall exactly when it occurred. Let's imagine that in truth, the person bought fast food somewhat in the recent past here. Generally speaking, we would expect a particular bias to emerge. Even though the truth, somewhat recent, we would expect that in general there'd be a bias in people's response. It'd be an erroneous estimate of when fast food is bought. Notice how the person here is actually guessing that the last time they bought fast food is a little more in the recent past. This is called a backward telescoping bias, where things that happen in the near timeline are often biased a little further into the past. Now let's illustrate another form of the telescoping bias. Same exact survey question. When was the last time you bought fast food? Now let's imagine the truth was in the real distant past. What will likely happen is that the estimate of when this actually occurred will be erroneous. In particular, the person will likely guess this, that this behavior occurred much more recent than it did. This is called a forward telescoping bias. As a marketing researcher using recall to collect behavioral data, we can realize how these types of biases make it very tricky to make good use of the information because of these systematic biases. As we're wrapping up our conversation about an introduction to collecting various types of primary data and marketing research, let's talk a little bit about the two broad-based forms of strategies that we use to actually collect primary data, that is communication-based and observation-based. Communication-based methods are any sort of data collection method that we may ever use where some form of communication is required 
on part of the respondent, the consumer, in giving that information. So if we do a one-on-one -on -one personal interview to collect that data, that's clearly communication-based. In addition, if someone takes an online anonymous survey, they still, by way of clicking on answers, are communicating with us. You can think of it as the most boring conversation you've ever had. Observation-based strategies are where we are actually observing an individual engage in a behavior. So if we were using video, uh, videotaped evidence in a retail store to watch how people behaved in that store, that would be observation-based. If we were analyzing the clickstream data of someone participating in our of someone interacting in our online store as they move towards purchase. Their clicks would be a series of behaviors. These are observation-based strategies. By looking at this wheel of typical variable categories measured in marketing research, it becomes clear that in certain situations, communication-based strategies are often superior if we want to measure that type of variable category. If we take the time to think about the fundamental differences between communication-based and observation-based strategies, some challenges emerge when it comes time to collect data for marketing research. For example, if we're interested in measuring someone's behavior, which is often the ultimate goal, so we're often very interested in actually observing what someone's doing along with anything else that we want to measure in our study, observation-based strategies tend to be the best. Observation-based strategies are actually watching that behavior actually occur. Whereas if we're using communication-based strategies, all those problems that emerge with recall biases can be problematic. On the other hand, if we want to measure those sort of things that exist strictly up in a person's mind, such as their level of satisfaction, what their intentions are, what their motivations are, beliefs, attitude, knowledge, and awareness, well, all of those things can only be directly measured if we use a communication-based method. We can't know someone's motivations without actually communicating with them. Now, there are some researchers who say you can measure motivations by looking at people's observations, but let's be clear what we're doing here. If we're using people's actual behavior to make guesses about what their underlying motivations are, what we're then doing is we're actually measuring behavior to infer motivations. If we actually want to try to tap into these ideas directly, we will have to use some sort of communication-based strategy. What's important to understand here is the fundamental conflict between communication-based research helping us measure so many of these different types of relevant marketing variables. Unfortunately, observation-based research that tracks the most important variable all, consumer behavior. This fundamental conflict where the data we ideally want is best, best collected through observation, but the, all the other types of variables that are so informative and helpful for marketing are best collected through communication-based strategies, this challenge is going to be persistent throughout most of our discussion about designing research. Finally, I merely want to emphasize that this particular conversation focused on talking about the type of primary data that we collect if we're interested in collecting information about individual consumers. Keep in mind, we often collect information because we're interested about brands, organizations, institutions, industries, or other products. So let me give you one quick example of where we collect primary data not to focus on consumers, but to instead focus on a different target. In this case, brands. What you're seeing here is six different alcoholic beverage brands, focusing in on Bacardi and Grey Goose. Then, what you see here is a chart representing how these two different brands, as well as the other ones that are lightly grayed out, how they perform with respect to a series of brand personality measures. So hundreds upon hundreds of consumers were asked to evaluate the personality traits they thought these particular brands had. So while we still collected information from consumers, the goal was to collapse that information, average it together to tell us what type of personality traits the actual brand had. In this example, we see that Bacardi, relative to Grey Goose, is seen as much more authentic, a little more daring, and a bit more friendly. On the other hand, Grey Goose is seen as more arrogant, which may not be so bad in the world of uh, alcoholic beverages, more intelligent, and more glamorous. You can imagine how this type of data is useful to marketers. It helps marketers understand how their brand is perceived in the minds of consumers relative to their nearby competition. This type of information can be very useful for brand positioning. This type of information can be very useful for future advertising campaigns.